I'm Jonas Ruta, and uh, I'm the, sort of the curator of the space uh, tempor uh, now and again. And this is a show for Jill Harrington Nichols, who, as I know, is a poet and a painter and a writer and a teacher. And I like what she has to say about her work, that her work uh, explores both the earthbound and outer expanses of our divine com cosmos. Her sense of color and composition has developed over the course of 30 years as a commercial artist. Uh, you have your undergraduate degree from the University of Colorado, Boulder, and, after, and then you were working on painting and with the uh, training at the Art Students League in New York City and MFA from Western Connecticut. So um, I wanted to ask her to talk about her, her, her paintings individually, but um, if she would like to give sort of an intro, uh, Jill. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you, your work. For I really coming. like your work. There's two chairs uh, up here, too, if you need a seat. Um, so thank you so much, and uh, thank you for the introduction and for curating my show, Jonas. Uh, oh, you're welcome. And for, for your friends that all came. Thank you. Um, and for my friends that came, too. <laughs> so um, I can go around. Uh, if, if you want me to explain one at a time, or... Well, tell us a little bit about your approach, or what. My approach. Maybe you can just integrate it, it into. It's kind of all different. Um, okay. So these that you can see right behind me, this this here uh, with the uh, clouds and the geese is a studio painting, whereas this other one, the darker one, is a plein air painting. So you'll see uh, there's kind of two different styles here because the plein air I tend to do faster, broad, broader strokes. Um, I'm very much in the moment. Um, and that's where the my thought of invisible bird song because there's a lot of things that are going into a painting when I'm painting plein air that you, you don't see in the painting but they're there you know the things I heard or felt or um, the wind and um, and then in the studio a lot of them are from memory um, uh, plus sometimes I use photo for reference most, really, I, I don't try to copy the photo. I, I use it as just kind of a trigger to memory um, and also uh, for the drawing part of it. And um, so the studio ones, um, I guess there, there's similarities with all of them. Oh, one of my friends here commented, uh, she likes the light in my painting, so I am I am loving to paint the light, um, and I do feel um, a connection to source to spirit when I'm painting, and I think that comes through um, in my paintings and why I called it the divine cosmos. So that's that's the the general. Is there? Yeah. Do you have other references to that phrase? Divine, Divine Cosmos? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, I did a painting um, of the Carina Nebula, which is um, on copper, and um, the Vatican Observatory has a, a print of that and another one of, uh, of Jupiter, which I call Juno. And so that's, that's the other part of the cosmos that I paint. The, uh, the outside, away from Earth. So, um, and I, I feel there's a connection with all, all of it. There's some chairs, two chairs here. Um, I was going to ask you about um, the first painting, Venice Tempest, because as I was noticing before, it had a lot of aspects of. Um, abstract painting in the floral part, even though it really no emotion. Well, so this is actually the Grand Canal in Venice, and um, I was there in 2019, uh, uh, and um, the artist, the, uh, um, I want to say biennial, but um, there's an art show there every two years, international art show. Um, and the, the name will come to me. But I was in there all day, and I came out, and it was very still, like 
uh, you know that stillness that comes before the storm. And um, within, within five minutes, it went from this perfectly still canal to this. And it was just crazy. And I, you know, I'd always wondered what Shakespeare meant by tempest. You know, we call them storms here in New England. But really, this, it was like, oh, now I get it. This is a tempest. <laughs> So that's why I called it the Venice Tempest. And so you can see in the background the view. Um, I'm on San Marco looking at across the way. And there is a vaporada there, which, which are very cool. They're buses on water, basically. And the sound of them sounds like something from a science fiction movie. Um, but I was struck, you know, that the uh, Dutch painters, if you look at their seascapes, I was always, it was like, what is this? Uh, their waves are kind of staccato and little, not like the waves we have here or the ocean. And I realized when I was there that it's really the, the waves are hitting against that canal and bouncing up. And that's why they get so big so fast. So that's, that's what you're seeing here is the bounce, the water coming in and then bouncing back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now the cloud formation also above the horizon it could also, it sort of uh, could be a mountain, sort of an, an ambiguous form as well. It is. It's, it's what I was kind of trying to do, what I try to do with a lot of my paintings is I, I try to kind of um, condense time and have, have a lot uh -huh. of different time in there, kind of like a play or a movie in a painting. So, so what I, I tend to do in a lot of my paintings is take different snippets from different times and, and put them together and from different angles in space as well. So, which is what I've done here. This one behind me is close to my home. And, um, you know, I've just often struck, I'm, I'm always looking up at the clouds and um, I have since I'm a small child. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when I was two, we were on a prop plane to California and, and uh, I just remember falling asleep looking at the clouds with my head on the pillow and thinking I was sleeping on the clouds, you know. So they always, um, and as a young child, as I'm sure many of you have always looked at the clouds and made shapes and everything. I'm not trying to make shapes in the clouds here, although some people will see them. Um, but here, I'm just capturing, um, here it's the closeness of the of sunset. You know, it feels like things are just closer. Um, and um, I often go on walks at this time of day, and this was on um, one of my walks. And this is from memory. This is on another walk. This is actually the same area. I, I live in a nice spot where I can walk a lot. And um, you know, if you get close up here, you see there's Canada geese. And it was kind of a windy day, and um, you know, it's that passage of time here that, that again, I'm kind of compressing time. This one, I had been painting um, the pond in my yard all day, and I had a, a lot of paint left on my palette, and I'd always wanted to paint this reservoir nearby, this is Trap Falls Reservoir in Huntington, uh, where I live, and um, it was just the, the setting sun, and um, so I, I was able to take all my paints and create all these grays, cool grays, warm grays. Now I work with temperature a lot in my painting too, and when I teach I color, I talk a lot about temperature and value. So um, this, is, this is one of those ones that is plain air on location. This one has an interesting story. This, this I was working on during my master's, which I went back much later in life and got, I, I, I wound up with my master's in 2015. Um, after I, you know, in 2000 I started painting after a, a career in graphic design, raising three sons. And um, so I took a lot of classes, our student league and different workshops. And then I went back and got my master's and uh, one of my, my full-time professors, and I told a few of you have wrote this story, but um, he had told me, you know, change this area here. And I thought about it for a little bit. And then a visiting professor came, and I, this was much brighter at one point, and blocked this off. And then this other professor really loved this painting. 
and he was talking about how you know we're this because if we're going through it we have to it's the it's the trotting through life that you feel without without the ethereal without the the, the visiting professor called it I, I, she said I, you like a party <laughs> so because of all the bright colors I had I, I did tone my party down but um, so if you look you do see you know it's a little more amb ambiguous here and um, um, but a lot, again, what catches my attention and what I, I, what I, this part I don't really, didn't even think about, you know, so a lot of times in my paintings I'm not thinking about certain, certain spots in my paintings may become the best part, and meanwhile, like killing myself trying to get just the right thing here, you know, um, and, and I see some painting friends laughing because they know what I'm talking about. Um, so yes? The sensation in that painting there of the lower part is yes. almost like a stage or a proscenium, you know. Yeah. So it gives it more of a, a context of uh, like drama in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, uh, one of my paintings um, that's not here is, uh, was, I called it Starry Night, which was Malay's Starry mm -hmm. Night, and actually mm -hmm. Van Gogh's Starry Night is mm -hmm. named after Malay's Starry Night. But uh, Malay had that feeling a lot too in the paintings. Um, the, um, the quietude, the, the um, being, being here grounded on earth is I think probably the sense you're getting from that. Mm. This one is from memory. I was on my way home. I was teaching at University of New Haven. And I was going over the Sikorsky Bridge and um, there was just this beautiful sun coming through these winter trees. It was, uh, you know, late March uh, when we're all really tired of winter. And um, it just struck me how hopeful that, that warm sun coming through those trees were. And I went home and just painted that from, from what I remembered seeing. It just probably is nothing like I saw, but it was the <laughs> feeling of, of what I saw. Mm -hmm. All right, and then this little guy is on copper. I started painting on copper uh, during my master's. Um, I started painting on aluminum flashing that I got at Hope Depot, and that was getting expensive, so I was like, well, let me go to a scrapyard. So I went to a scrapyard and picked up a bunch of aluminum, plus they had some beautiful pieces of copper, um, which is the one that's at the Vatican is on a big piece of scrap copper. This is also scrap copper, a little guy. Um, and again, it's that, um, from one of my walks, you know, one of those beautiful times of day, the sunset, and I, I left a lot of the copper coming through, and I chose the copper colors because the copper, you know, I wanted to have the copper coming through. There's one across the room that's very similar, but it's also a copper behind my niece's head. <laughs> Hello, Melissa. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, she came all the way from Manhattan, yes. Yeah, how do you keep the, uh, the copper from oxidizing? Um, well, so far it hasn't. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> we um, I, I, I keep an eye on it, because uh, I, I, I would probably just steel wool it. I, oh. This this one has varnish on it. Um, I think I varnished this one too, and the varnish should protect that yeah. um, oxygen from okay. getting to it. Um, I think there's enough oil on even where I leave, because uh, a lot of times I'll wipe off the paint. That mm -hmm. when you're painting on metal, you paint very, you paint very thin and wipe off. So I think there's hopefully enough residue there that will keep it from oxidizing. But I, that's going to be an interesting part of the painting too. But um, the the phi, the the large one I'm talking about, the Crina nebula, um, has a lot of that verde green in it. So that was one of the things I was thinking with the copper. We'll, we'll see yeah. over time. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be my my problem. But <laughs> all right, should we? Swing, okay. Swing here. Next. All right. I'll try to follow you here. Okay. So um, this is a this wall here. Um, there's more seats down here, and uh, there's more chairs there. So please make yourself comfortable. I need you. <laughs> your friend. Um, so
So this one is Italy, and um, I was getting ready. I, I started uh, teaching. I was dropping my two prints off at the Vatican, so I figured, well, I might as well um, run a workshop there. And one of my friends here introduced me to this beautiful villa in Italy. So I, this was the night before I was starting getting ready to teach, and um, I thought I'd better get comfortable in the studio. So this is a, a plein air painting I did uh, looking out of the studio uh, of these beautiful tiles they have in Italy, these terracotta, the roofs. This uh, one here with the bright yellow uh, was in North Stanford. There's a beautiful place. They support children's music. And they invited us artists. Um, one of the women was playing harp music while we painted. So um, it's a, the place is called Music in the Woods. And they actually have an event tomorrow night, or tomorrow afternoon. Um, so I called this Rhapsody in Color because, it, you know, again, you're not seeing what I'm, what I'm feeling or hearing, but I'm hearing harp music and birds singing. And the rain started to fall just about when I started painting. So there's raindrops and, um, and all the other painters talking back and forth. And, the whole experience. This little guy, the third one in, I is um, uh, at the Weir Farm, which is a historic site in Connecticut. And I'm very proud to say we have the only historic site dedicated to painting. Uh, I was the Connecticut Impressionist painting uh, family. Uh, there were three generations of painters, and uh, they're the Weirs, and they made it into a historical site. You can go there. A lot of painters go there and paint. Uh, my friend Patricia and I go there and paint a lot. Um, there's a group there now, too. Um, Thursday, night, Thursday mornings in the good seasons, we meet and talk about art. And um, So this was a quick little painting uh, of the woods. There's a, there's, the fields have been kind of overtaken by a lot of woods there. So this is uh, looking into the woods and the coolness. You know, again, I paint about temperature a lot, so um, this is using those warms and cools to show the sun and the Weir Farms in Richfield? It's uh, in no. Richfield and Wilton. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's worth a day trip uh, mm -hmm. if, if um, you know, if you like to walk and there's a mm -hmm. pond you can walk to and they've, they've done a lot with it. And they support the painting, which is yeah. uh, how, how good can you get, right? The, the far one is again in Italy. Uh, when I went to visit my friend Patricia uh, at this villa, uh, it was a morning in March, and I'm painting out the villa window here. Um, I had brought some, a small set of paints with me, and I was just struck by those beautiful reds. Um, mm. And so... That's the, and these are all oil. Sort of a coppery red. When, yeah. And you, this one's, this is copper, right? So you have yeah, the thing. Yeah, but this is Connecticut. This, right. These, these two on the ends are Italy. Yeah. All right, can we swing around oh, here? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. So here, this one here is um, Silver Mine, where I teach. This is one of my um, class demos. Uh, so I started in class. Um, and usually I'm busy helping my students, so I don't really complete a painting. I get them started. So this was completed in the studio where, you know, it's a big difference. Uh, painting on location, not only are you getting invisible bird song and whispering winds, but you're also getting rain or lots of wind or lots of sun or bugs. And, you know, it's, it's a lot. Um, and you don't really have great work area. So it's, it's nice when I can take a painting back into the studio and, um, you know, have, just have a presence of mind and just kind of slow down and finish. This one here I call Olana, which is another great, you can do it in a day. It's about a two hour ride from here. It's along the Hudson River and Frederick Church, who um, he and his teacher Thomas Cole were the ones that started what we all call the Hudson River School of Painting. And he built this place called Olana. It's uh, inspired by a per uh, Persia. He spent a lot of time in Persia, built a castle, uh, or house, 
with a lot of Persian influence. And then it's on these acres of grounds, right on the Hudson River. So this is from one day where I was painting plain air. And I'm like, oh, look at those clouds. They're magnificent. You know, they're sweeping over the mountains, over the river. And I didn't pay attention. Of course, it was started to storm, you know. So I ran to my car and uh, just I grabbed everything, ran to the car as it really started to pour rain. Um, and I thought I was done. That was it, you know. It was getting dark. And as I was leaving, this long driveway down, uh, this was the scene I got, this beautiful rainbow. And uh, Frederick Church, if you're familiar with his work, he um, did a lot of, he has a lot of uh, rainbows in his work. He did, um, he, he did a lot of traveling. He went to Persia, South America, and um, you know, he painted really grand studio paintings. This painting's also on aluminum. And this, this was actually one of my first paintings on aluminum. This is for a piece of flashy from Home Depot, three by three feet aluminum. It's thin, but then I made the mistake of mounting it on birch plywood, which I won't do again because it's really heavy. But because um, the aluminum part was very light, but it was wobbly. Um, so again, I, I've kind of here, this was also during my master's work, and I, I kind of got rid of any land or sea, and uh, this is this is my working way up towards the cosmos. This was the step between here and the Carina Nebula and Jupiter. Um, so, you know, here, again, this is a cloud near my home, and it was just, you know, the softness of it, the etherealness of it, and I like the idea of putting something so soft and ethereal against something extruded from the Earth's crust, this, this hard aluminum. It's kind of a yin yang in life. This one, if, you, if you're a painter and um, interested in painting landscapes, I have a uh, YouTube video where I have part one. I, I need to edit part two, so. Um, but this I did as a demo in my landscape uh, video. Uh, again, this is Italy. Uh, I had done a plein air painting of this too, which is which is quite different. Uh, and again, you'll see the difference between uh, painting on location and in the studio. Of course, this is kind of like plein air because I'm painting fast and talking and teaching at the same time. Uh, this this is kind of the sister piece to this one. Uh, again, on another piece of flashing aluminum and. Um, this is looking at the zenith of the cloud and just looking up straight above. Um, and as you might have told by now, uh, you know, my favorite color is blue. So, um, so lots of blues. Uh, this is like the one across the way. This is on a scrap piece of pop copper. This is one of my first pieces on copper, not the first. I, I don't know. I've done so many. People ask me how many paintings you have. I have no idea. So, um, but this is kind of warped, you know, if you look closely, there's some imperfections because it's a piece of scrap copper. And um, I decided to keep them that way. And the painting five, which is 101 inches by 36 inches on that piece of scrap copper, has uh, also imperfections and waves in it. And I was, I was going to like mount it to something. And thankfully the framer helped me say, why and you know it's like why yeah because space has waves right so so it kind of talks about the the you know the time and uh, time warp and so I'm happy to say it I, I left those imperfections as well and then finally this last one is another one in Italy another painting demo uh, this was in the summer and it was a passing thunderstorm and um, so again I'm was just fascinated with the rain coming across the horizon. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm not asking. I have a question. Yes? Do you um, still show it to Southport when they're on plain air? The Southport the Quad Library when they have their plain air paint out? Um, I did do that one year, a long time I ago. I remember you, yeah. You do? Okay. Yeah, you have a good memory, thank you, yeah. In the summer, I am teaching at a, a, a friend's, she has a beautiful studio right near their library. 
Um, and I, I teach lessons there in her studio. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Well, I just think your geographical transitions become more like ethereal progressions in a way, if you know what I mean. It's like you're going in higher and higher levels or layers of, of the out, outer world in the space, you know. Yeah, I'm getting more and more specific. It's more, it's become more <laughs> mythical. You become more myth, yeah, metaphys metaphysical. Or, well, that's the advantage of metaphor because things, you know, when you have a painting in your house and you might look at it one day and then a year later you'll see something totally different you never saw in it before, you know, and that changes your perspective and then, yeah, you know. And that's true for the painter as well. You know, sometimes I'll walk into, yeah. it's like, you know, if you ever walk into your closet and say, that's my piece of clothing, you know? <laughs> right. I, I do that with paintings all the time. I'm like, did I paint that? Mm -hmm. yeah. right. <laughs> yes? What made you decide on those two behind me uh, that seem almost like compressions, but yeah. even almost expressions somewhere between the two? Mm -hmm. and, uh, the colors are really um, so, you know, of course that's brighter than the woods in Connecticut, you know, in April, and it was raining, so, but there was just a field of daffodils all around, and so that's more, it is more of an impression of how I was feeling with this heart music playing, it was just, it was very upbeat and very, just full of color. So, um, so yes, I do. I do go back and forth between the very colorful and then the more subdued. Um, and again, those are painting on location. So, uh, you know, when I first started, and I still do it once in a while. Everything I paint, I used to paint everything too big, you know, off scale because it just felt so like right there. And when you're painting on location, that's how it feels. So, um, so that's part of what you're sensing there. Is I'm. It's like right there in my eyes. This this yellow that, and these these shadows and the blues. Um, they were just right there. Any other questions? Yes. It's not a question, but just um, hearing you speak. That was a phrase that stood out for me. I thought of John Didion's slouching toward Bethlehem because you said working my way toward the cosmos. <laughs> and I thought, what a great phrase. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I probably yeah. didn't even realize I said that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for coming. The, the show. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, we have more questions. Tell us about the work Go. you did. Well, thank you. In the Vatican, you might have spoken. About yes. <laughs> I did. Thank you, Bill, thank you. for the plug. Thank you. Bill yes, I wanted to know about Valley that. Valley Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for supporting we me. We have your beautiful work in our office. Thank too. you. Yeah. Your Shelton seeds. Beautiful. That's right. It's beautiful. And I, I was explaining here, um, a lot of these are Shelton skies. Mm -hmm. uh, most of these are from my walks in Shelton. Wow. So, um, but I did mention the one in the Vatican, but thank you, I'll give it another plug. So um, the, I have two paintings, that, the prints of which are in the Vatican Observatory, which is in Castel Gandolfo. Um, so the, the, the Vatican Observatory started in the 1500s when they needed to redo the calendar. And then they started um, studying, you know, we all know about the Galileo and the Vatican, but um, they finally saw the light. And they're, they're really, uh, it's Jesuits that are studying, they're real scientists. And um, they moved the telescope that was near the St. Peter's Basilica to Castel Gandolfo because of light pollution in like the 1930s. And then by 1950, the Castillo Gandolfo uh, light pollution was already getting really bad. And um, so now they've made, they still have their headquarters there, which is very cool. They house these uh, meteorites. They have one of the biggest, uh, world's biggest collections of meteorites. And that's one of the things they study. They also study the spectrum, which, you know, which is kind of ironic because that's what I do too. So um, there's a lot of spectrum. They can tell what, um, you know, scientists can tell what's in space by the color. So there is that, that connection there. And um, 
so they they made the what they had two telescopes there. One was just a spectral telescope, 